Let your peace flow through me. Let the quiet calm surround me. It's almost a little jarring to hear that beautiful song from Beth Byers and, of course, Beth Byers in the candlelit evening where she recorded it. And then to see me standing here in the bright sunshine of this morning. And it's one of those things I am still not used to on this island when the decorative lights so common this time of year seem to spring up somehow. I am reminded so often that this is the end of the year with all its many celebrations, more by the lights I see in shopping centers, on homes, and in front of houses of worship than by almost anything else. Almost. Because this time of year is also a time when I remember the magic of perhaps the greatest Christmas movie ever made, A Charlie Brown Christmas. I promise I will not get too nostalgic here, and I know that as a community of Unitarian Universalists, we recognize and celebrate many, many, many more holidays this time of year than just Christmas. But that is also sort of the point of a Charlie Brown Christmas. In it, Charlie, our unlikely hero, struggles with the commercialism that surrounds him and seems to be infecting all those closest to him. When asking his little sister Sally what she wanted for Christmas, she goes on a long, long list of the kinds of consumer products, not to mention real estate she wants Santa to deliver to her. And even Snoopy, far from a, a particularly loyal beagle, he gets into the act too, decorating his doghouse in a competition to have the best decorations in town. One person wants all the things they can dream of, and a beagle wins a competition to be the best Christmas decorator. Yeah, Charlie Brown looked at all these manifestations of this time of year and had only one thing to say, you can probably say it with me, good grief. With the exasperation Charlie has, I wonder now what a member of our earliest human ancestors, one that watched the skies carefully and let the natural world be the guide for their life, according to the changes in season, the altering of the light across the land, would think of all the ways this time of year has dribbled away in small creeks or tributaries of different beliefs from the main river, the source, the coursing artery that is what will happen tonight at 12.02 a.m., when the longest night spreads across the northern hemisphere, before the earth wobbles back, lengthening our days once more. Our ancestor might be a little surprised to see the ways their species now looks at this momentous day or this time of year. They might be a little exasperated. They too might utter whatever the ancient equivalent is of the words, good grief. Now, not everyone really knows what is happening on this day to make the solstice happen, but you're about to. The Earth wobbles on its axis. Some people like to say it tilts, but don't you kind of like the idea of a planet wobbling? Like it got up too quickly from the couch or it had a little bit too much punch at the holiday party, but that is what is happening. The axes of the Earth are tilting to and fro all year. And tonight in the Northern Hemisphere, where most of us are, the axis will reach its farthest point from the sun. At the pole of that axis, in fact, it will be night or twilight all day. And then the axis is going to do what? Wobble back, of course. But first it does something else. Yeah, for a moment, it's going to stop. The progress of six months to the other wobble point, the drunken slide along the hallway, the Earth's transit around the sun, will hit that wall and won't go any further. It's going to stop, which is exactly what solstice means, actually. From the Latin sol, sun, and sistere, stop. The sun stops, right? No, it does not. Anyone who said yes is in on the problem. Good grief. The sun is right where it always is. The earth is actually what is stopping. It's really a terrestis, if you want to be, you know, a little silly about it. The Earth stops tonight for just a moment. 
For a lot of us, it's felt like the Earth maybe has come to a kind of standstill for months now. For three seasons now, we have met this way we are here right now. We have halted a lot of what we were so used to doing. We have hunkered. We have sheltered. We have masked. Some of us have traveled, which felt a little strange and a little naughty. But so many of the things we did, the actions we took, are not what we do anymore. They've stopped. But it's a funny thing about stopping. When we take a moment, even a brief one, and we silently consider the stillness around us, as Beth so beautifully intoned, sometimes there is something in us or around us that we really didn't notice was there. Friends, this is a time of year when, in years past, we were bombarded with ads, with parties, with decorations, events, and other engagements, so much so that it felt like we were running a marathon that ended on New Year's Day. The clamor for more and more in our schedule, more and more in our bellies, and more and more in the hands of others in the forms of gifts can eclipse the very reason any celebration of this time of year ever took place. Stopping. But this year, so much of what we have to do, so much of what we did before has stopped. And we are left, many of us, with what is really feels like to be stopped. And not all of us like it. Being busy, being busy distracts from thinking about a lot of things a mind wants to consider. Having a full calendar keeps one sort of moving into the future, planning tomorrow, today. And it doesn't give a lot of time to look back, to reflect on the way things went, or simply to stop and be present with the right now, with this moment. Perhaps never before has the real meaning of the solstice, of the sun appearing to stop its lowering progress across the daytime sky, been more important to recognize, not only because it's good for a person's mind to stop every once in a while, not only because there is merit in stopping the focus on the commercialization of this time of year, not even because of the power of stopping the competition that happens for every single one of our personal attention and focus this time of year, but because of what else we are stopping. Self-centered thinking. See, the very name of the solstice is wrong. The only reason we call it a solstice, the imaginings of others that the sun itself is halting in the sky, is what? Is only a self-centered hypothesis that arose of a perception proved long ago to be false. That since we perceived with our eyes and our watches, or sundials, that the sun was stopping and moving higher again in the sky, then that must be what's happening. But we know now very well that's not what's happening. It's us. We little inhabitants of this tiny little orb wobbling along its orbit are the ones who are moving and not the other way around. I love the way astronomers remind us sometimes so simply that we are so far from the center of the universe. But we really can't help it, can we? All around us are so many ways that we are told we are a universal center. And the religions of the world are part of what does that. Greek and Roman pagan religions couldn't help but show how divine immortal deities were fascinated and so interested in the lives of humans, of the lowly moral, uh, mortal creations. The Hindu faith, one of the oldest continually practiced faiths on the planet, is filled with stories of deities, of the divine interacting with humans as well. The story of the Maccabees outlasting a military campaign that we call Hanukkah against all odds with the help and intervention of the divine, alongside the Christian message of the divine itself mingling with human flesh in the person of Jesus. These stories begin to paint a pretty self-centered, or maybe more accurate to say human-centered way of experiencing the divine at work in the world through time. Even in the Hawaiian religion, the ali'i, the high-born or ruling chiefs, are said to be descendants, direct descendants, 
of the father or sky god, Wakea, and the mother or earth goddess, Hapa. So even if the divine didn't want to meddle too much in human affairs, humans still have benefited from the involvement or perceived involvement to support their faith, sure, but also to support their power, their economic power. So when Charlie Brown heard the list of everything his sister wanted for Christmas and saw his faithless beagle winning a prize for decorating his doghouse, his exclamation of good grief at the commercialization of a date meant to remember the welcoming of the divine into human form was only the next voice in a chorus of the ages that was bemoaning the way that economic advantage or power or commercialism seems to follow lockstep with control of access to the divine or a claim to some part of those in power to be divine themselves. But we wonder about our poor Charlie. We wonder because feeling a loss or a change like the one he feels because of the way that so many around him seem to miss the point or baldly take advantage of this time of year is a loss or a change that isn't going anywhere. He is grieving in some measure for something that in his lifetime is not going to change anytime soon. And when one grieves something that is never going to get any better and might only get worse, that is what we call complex grief. It is bound up in something that will keep happening over and over for a long time and will never get better. And so to grieve something like that can lead to real problems for the person grieving. This week I had a bit of a feeling myself of this. It's not unlike the saga that actually that has been going on with our Black Lives Matter banner that's on the Poly Highway. In case you're keeping count, on Friday I hung the fourth banner. Two were entirely taken down. The last one simply had the word black cut out of it. A clear message that someone hopes to make invisible the very lives that have suffered the indignity of invisibility for so long, so long in this nation. To grieve every occurrence of something that might keep happening came to mind of a spiritual folly. That is what it is. It might just be easier, as it's turned out, to just buy more signs. But grief is a little different in an event that only happens once say a loss of a life, a loss of a love, an accident, missing traveling, or something like that. These are things that may happen for a period or once and might always hurt, might always be there, but one does not keep reliving and reliving and reliving the experience, at least not usually. Of course, some forms of trauma do make people feel like they're reliving the powerful moments of loss and pain, but mostly this kind of grief, the kind that flows from a discrete loss or a set of losses, as strange as it sounds to say it, is good grief. It's the kind we can recognize at times as the way we honor what it is we are missing, what it is that is lost from us. And it is what so many of us are experiencing in so many ways in these times. I heard a story on the radio Thursday about a superintendent of schools. She decided and declared a snow day in her northeastern town because there was so much snow and it just seemed like the right thing to do. Even though everyone was already doing school from home, she said that the joy she saw in the pictures that came back to her after she declared this day and to her colleagues of families in their pajamas enjoying a weekday off from work and Zoom and screens made it clear how much everyone was missing a sense of normalcy. She said that a snow day in the life of school children is, in a word, freedom. Yes, a part of us would wonder rightly about students who lack the electronic means ever to keep up right now and that school has turned into a vastly more stressful experience for literally every person involved in it. But for that one day, in that district, 
in that town, it stopped. And for a few snow-caked hours there, grief was spared by spirits lifted. And that is good grief. The kind that can be lifted, if only for a time, by some of the smallest things. A gesture, a call, a surprise, or even a monologue. See, when Linus, the Peanuts character, answers Charlie's question, can somebody tell me what Christmas is all about? The action of the special stops in its tracks right there, and Linus calls for a spotlight. Then plainly and gently, he intones the story of a new light entering the world, a baby born this day who is to be a sign unto all persons. And in the sight of this child, a divine force appears in the heavens, praising God on high while wishing peace on earth and goodwill to all. That is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Indeed. So many of the stories of this time, and even the stories about the stories of this time, like our story for all ages, like the snow day that came right on time, in their primal telling are stories about the heavens, the celestial, the sky we toil under, that lights the dark nights of so many souls in these times, through all times. And these stories are trying to make sense between what is happening beyond our control in the heavens, in the stars, or in the terrible and fearsome mind of a goddess or god, and what it means to live our lives here together with one another. And so many of these stories grow and develop in ways that bring the celestial light so far, so distant, into our very own lives as creatures light years away. Even astrophysics tells us we are made of star stuff. But some of these stories, through time and in the hands of mouths of humans, become stories of unearned privilege and unchecked power by one set of humans over others, and it has to stop. Stories meant to share the universality of a single experience are parceled out too often and broken shamelessly to support the dominance of one culture over another, and it has to stop. Stories meant to see, to welcome, to praise by the barest light amid the lengthening shadows are washed out with a clamor for power and a blurred vision of dominance one over another, and it has to stop. Stories meant to love, to bring the divine close enough to enfold the mortal world with warmth and care are barbed with the fear that we might not be good enough, that we might not be loved, and that we might be alone. Unless we do as a powerful elite tells us we should, unless we get all that many tell us we should have, unless we win, and it has to stop. And it stops here. It stops in a place that upholds the worth and the dignity of all life. It stops in a mind like your mind that unafraid fares forth in learning together to love one another better. And it stops in the hearts of each one of you, of each one of us, who seek together a deeper truth, who search together for a wider love, who gladly welcome the tidings of a day when unchecked power and unearned privilege will perish at last from this earth. Tonight the earth pauses, literally, imperceptibly. Tonight the threads of stories spin into yarn and weave again the fabric of ages. And tonight we prepare to bid farewell to this year, this passage around the heavenly body that sustains one and all. We say goodbye. We wonder what it was all about at times. And in departing, we may be sad or miss something of the year, but that, my friends, is good. It is good cheer in the days ahead when we might celebrate. It is goodwill to all and peace on earth. And yes, it's even good grief. So as we all stop today, or as we all turn today, and wonder together at the planets aligning in our sight tonight, or wonder together at the star that marked the site where a baby is born. Wonder together at the star that guided the journey to this island for its first human inhabitants. Wonder together at the star that universally unites every living thing on this planet. As we stop today, it is good to know that someday soon we all may be together, if the fates allow. Until then, my friends, 
hang a shining star upon the highest bough. May it ever be so. Blessed be and amen.